Hey folks, thanks for joining me. My name is Karen Dave, and this is the next episode of Rednet Rising. This is a series where I look over Power Crystal's amazing Mine Factory Reloaded mod and specifically talk about the Rednet feature of it, which is the amazing Rednet logic system. Uh, the last episode I covered Rednet Cable, which is interesting and powerful enough to really warrant its own uh, episode and its own discussion, but we're going to step it up a notch in this episode and start talking about the programmable Rednet controller which is a very powerful device. So powerful that it's probably a little intimidating to start, but I think by the end of this episode, hopefully you'll see that it's about as easy to use as it possibly could be, and it can replace basically all of your redstone logic ever. It's an exceptionally cool system. So without further ado, let's get started. Now, before you can use the programmable Redneck controller, you'll have to craft it. And the first thing you need for that is a housing, which is a decorative block in and of itself that looks pretty interesting. The recipe is not too bad, a little bit of plastic, redstone, iron, glass, basically nothing. Uh, although you will need to have a handy supply of the plastic sheets, both for this and, of course, if you recall, for the cable, which takes a lot of it over time. But once you have the housing, you can then craft the controller itself, which looks a lot like this one, but has a subtle difference. Well, when you lay it down, it faces you. And what that means is that the open side is facing you as you place it. This open side looks like the inside of a computer. It looks pretty cool in there, I think. And the outside looks like the decorative block that we saw. Let's lay down one, and uh, let's, uh, let's have it um, so that we are facing north, and its opening is facing south, as you can see on my minimap. Now, let's take a look inside and see what's up with it. Now, don't panic. The interface inside is a little complicated looking, and it's a lot of words. Uh, but it actually is a very, very helpful system, and it's, it's very, very clear what it's doing. We'll talk about these functions that you're seeing here in a second. But first, I want to talk about these buttons over here. You'll see it says 1 of 6, and we can go next, previous. Every programmable Redneck controller comes with, at first, six functions it can perform simultaneously. However, we, I'll show you how a little bit later, we can upgrade it to perform more functions simultaneously. So let's talk about what that means. Let's just set up something simple. How about something we saw the last time? We're going to take this on the, we're going to face that that way. So that's on, I guess, the um, east side, yes. And how about over here, we put a lever. So we've got almost exactly the thing I showed you in episode one. However, uh, in this case, we're going to be having the roadnet controller in the middle. So how about if we just say to start that we'd like to take the white channel from the western side and pass it through to the white channel on the eastern side. Well, turns out that's pretty easy to do. What we'll do is we'll look down our list and, oh look, pass through. Interesting. And you'll, so once we've selected a function, it's highlighted. And then over here on the left, you'll see the input. Sometimes there'll be multiple inputs. Sometimes there won't. Sometimes there won't be any inputs at all. Um, on the right, you'll see the output. Sometimes there will be multiple outputs. Sometimes there won't be any outputs at all. But there's a variety of things. First, you select the target. The target um, f for this is, you can see the I.O. from the north, south, east, west, up, down, right? And then we'll get to those couples in just a sec. But what we're saying here is that we'd like to take the white input from the west side. And it turns out that if we click through here, we'll see a W pop up pretty fast. Oh, west. And the color here is, of course, the color from the cable. So we are saying that we'd like to pass through from the west side the signal on the white cable. Now, for the output, I think you can guess what we want to do. We want to send it to the east side on the white cable. Now, if I throw the switch, the illuminator turns on. If I throw the switch again, the illuminator turns off. So all we've done is basically configure this to be a piece of wire, right? But there's a lot more we can do with it. For example, uh, we can ask it for, well, a whole bunch of things. So let's add a classic function. If we were to be using vanilla redstone and we were to be using repeaters, we could introduce a delay, right? And that's a, one of the many, many uh, purposes that people use repeaters for. So let's click on delay. Notice that it's going to keep our uh, input from the west. Um, and the delay is how long we want to delay for. So this is a good one. The output is still east white. Now let's say we want to delay for a full second. In Minecraft, we talk about time in terms of ticks, within the best case, one second being 20 ticks. So let's go ahead, and um, what we want to do is somehow set the delay value as a number from this. Now, it turns out that there's a couple of ways we can do this, but the easiest way for our purposes is not to use any input at all, 
I'd rather use a constant. So that's what CNST stands for, constant. Now let's just go ahead and click this up. De -de 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 -de. Let's make it 20. That should be about a second, right? And the output's the east. So what happens now? When we click, it takes about a full second to come online. And when we unclick, it takes about a full second to go offline. Pretty neat, huh? Next, let's just take a minute and talk about the multiple page feature that I discussed before. I said that the Redneck controller can do lots of things at the same time. Six things with the unupgraded controller. Take a look. If we hit next, everything disappears. Now, don't worry. Nothing actually went away. If you go prev, the pass-through function is still there. And of course, the lamp that we've lit is still lit. But if we go to the next page, we can see that there's like a whole new blank interface. Now, why don't we pretend for a minute that we, we want to have one lever do two things. So let's say we have an illuminator right here. We put down a piece of cable. And perhaps we aren't using for this one the white. We're using the orange. Now, naturally, as it stands, this lever has nothing to do with that because it only is assigned to go through the, the controller to the white channel. And even though this is the right output side, it is not exactly what we want. So let's do this. Let's go, we are here we are on page two. Let's copy the same thing we had before. Pass through. From the west. And we'd like it to go out to the east. But in this case, on the orange channel. Ta-da! As you can see, now the switch is wired to do both those things. Now, it may not look like much, but actually what's happening here is pretty cool because two things are happening in one block at the same time. You can't see it except by the lamps, but two things are happening at once. Now, I can prove that by changing this from pass-through to something else. How about the opposite of pass-through? Inverter. Inverter, instead of passing through the signal, actually inverts it, which means that if it's on, it turns off, and if it's off, it turns on. You'll note that the light immediately switched off. Check this out. Now, if we go like this, now when we turn off the switch, white turns off and orange turns on, just like we asked. It's a really powerful feature, but it's even more powerful than that. Let me show you. The Redneck controller, you see, can do logic, which is so cool. Uh, and this is a lot like what you'd think of from Red Power or perhaps vanilla redstone logic. So let's lay down a vanilla lamp here. Let's put a piece of cable. And let's make this uh, use the magenta color. How about that? Something we haven't used yet. So, as an example of logic, let's set ourselves a goal. We need, let's say, well, how about one more switch, right? Let's do one more switch, and let's lay down a piece of cable. And let's say that when these, whoa, when these two switches are on, uh, then when both of them are on, then we'll light up that lamp, right? So let's uh, make this more interesting, because it's kind of cheating right now, if we were, and it would be impossible, but let's just change it to white, to light blue. How about that? So now we have these two segments. Oh, and it's worth noting something. The programmable Redneck controller doesn't connect cables. What do I mean? Well, let's turn both these on. And let's whip out our trusty Redneck meter. White, on. Light blue, on. You look over here. Just white. Hey, where's the light blue? Well, that's because it doesn't actually connect. The signals that get sent out the eastern and western side are what the programmable Redneck controller tells them. In other words, what you tell them. It doesn't do anything else. It doesn't connect the cables. If we were to connect the cables, like so, then if we were to look, this network would now be just one big network and it's white and light blue on both sides. Let's get rid of that again. Still on over here and off over there. So keep that in mind. It's actually a very good feature. Let's turn this off for a second, go into the controller. Now what we'd like to do is make that magenta line come up. Let's see, what we need to do is we need to say if the, the western white and blue lines are up, then we need to output on the eastern magenta line. Hmm. And white and blue. Oh, look, there's a function right here. And in fact, there's three functions and three input and four input. And there's a couple other functions that can do anding as well, although in different ways. Let's stick with the basic two input because that's all we need for now. Let's just go ahead and set this both to the west. And this one, of course, takes the light blue. The output well, I think you know, we want to put it to the east and set that to magenta, right? So what this is going to say is that if both switches are on, on the west-hand side, so we have the light blue and we have the white, then we will, on the eastern side, emit a magenta signal. 
Seems kind of too good to be true, huh? Aha, it turned on. Isn't that cool? And I mean, look at this. So we're still doing all this other stuff over here, right? All the other things are still online. They're all happening. Um, and so this program over that controller can actually do a ton of stuff for you. It can do so many things. And we haven't even really hit the most cool part yet. So let me show you that next. One of the things that RedNet has that really we've never gotten to play with before as Minecraft players is really sophisticated uh, wave functions. Now, you'll see there's a ton of stuff here that if you're familiar with uh, vanilla redstone and the high end of redstone, redstone hacking or maybe digital logic or computer programming, some of these will make sense to you. But that's, you know, not what we're really talking about here. What we're talking about here is this wave function. In particular, it says timer here. Everyone who's ever used Red Power 2's timers will find this one familiar, although it looks a little different in this format. Click it. Now, it has on the left-hand side an input of PD, and the output side is Q. Now, for a lot of the digital logic things, Q is the output, and then a lot of times it'll have the opposite of the output, because that can be very useful as sharp. So, for example, Q, Q naught. In this case, we don't have the opposite. We can make it if we wanted, and I'll show you how in a second, but Q and Q naught. So what then is PD? PD here in this case means pulse duration. Now you can actually control it with the values of vanilla redstone, but we're not going to do that just yet. Let me just set it to a variable, so it's or I have it to a constant, so it's super easy to see. Um, the clock in RedNet functions on the same ticks as Minecraft, 20 ticks in a second. If you haven't heard that before, don't stress about it. All it means is that you have 20 ticks in a second. So let's make a timer that runs one second. We just click through like that, right? And now we're on a timer of one second. And the output, well, let's not mess with anything we've got existing. Let's output to the white top, right? So now we need a piece of redneck cable. Nope, got a shift click. There we go. And uh, let's put another illuminator there. How about we abuse our out powers, fly up in the air, and doop. hey, look at that. It's now, it's now pulsing just like as if it were connected to a Red Power 2 timer. Look at that. On, off. On, off. Think about it for a second. What you're really seeing here is a wave. That's, it's only on or off. It's on for a second. It's off for a second. It's, it's on for a second. It's off for a second. But we can do more than that. Because in Minecraft 1.5, there are lots of different values for redstone. You remember, it could be on. It could be off. It could be half on. You can use comparators. All these cool things. We support that with this. We get, to, we, we get to be supported by that. We can use that. So check this out. What if we were to use a sine wave? Now that is a regular sine wave. If you've ever taken math class, just know that what it does is it goes on and off. Now, this guy, unfortunately, won't function by default unless we switch it. But this is, there we go, scaled proportional. Look at that. It's pulsing gently. Let's increase the time a little bit because it's kind of flickering back and forth pretty fast. Uh, well, and no, let's, we're going to be stuck with that one, but that's uh, okay. Oh, you see there's all sorts of different wave functions. And they all pulse. And they're so cool, right? Now, there are lots of things you can hook up to this that work. Um, you can read proportional values. You can write proportional values. These waves can be useful in lots of places. Let's go back to the sign. And let's grab another red net block that I really have been hoping to show off. How about the note? There's a red net. Redstone, let's see, yeah, there's it. Red note block. So let's grab one of these and replace it. Let's, we don't need levers for a sec. You ready for this? This is super cool. You may have to turn up the sound so you can hear it. Let's make sure that you can hear it in all its glory. It's a, kind of a Kind of endless, huh? <laughs> let's try a different wave. So this helps you hear, let's turn it down just a little bit. This helps you sort of hear what the wave is doing. Sawtooth falling, sawtooth rising, sine wave. Now we're getting into some serious Philip Glass territory here. Wave triangle. Sounds a lot like the sine, but a little bit more straight, a little more linear, and finally the square. So it just turns on and off. Uh, this one, the reason that it's going so fast, by the way, is that it's, as you can see, we'll change it. A 
But those wave functions are incredibly powerful and they can do all sorts of crazy things. There are obviously a ton of functions in here and they're all useful and they're not actually documented. If you look in this uh, little RedNet manual here, you can see they're not actually documented. Uh, but he does go through a couple of example builds. And by the way, you can craft this manual pretty straightforwardly. But you'll, you will just probably need to actually play with these functions to really understand what they do. Because even if you think you know, sometimes in the context of Minecraft logic, it gets a little complicated. But there's one more thing I want to show you, and then we're going to move on to some practical builds. The last logical feature that we should talk about before we do a practical build is the fact that in RedNet, the output of pages, you've seen like inverter, or timer can be the input to other pages. Now, that may seem confusing, but actually in practice it's really, really useful. Let me show you an example. Let's say we'd like to make this Redstone Illuminator blink. Well, we've seen how to do this. All we have to do is uh, go to page one and uh, pull up our timer, which is our square wave. We'll give it a nice constant period of, hmm, let's say 20 seconds. So not to sit here clicking too much set the output of course to the eastern white side and now we have blinking but what if we wanted to be able to control that with a lever well that seems pretty reasonable and uh, we've used an AND gate to control things with levers how can we do that well instead of outputting directly to the east line we can output to a variable in this case we'll output the variable zero that number isn't a value it's just a name so variable zero could, as well, could might as well be variable charlie variable zero so now if we pull out a RedNet controller and give a right click to this, we'll actually see our clock, our one second clock still firing. And you see variable zero set to 15 and it's zero. So we can just keep going like this forever. Pretty slick, I think. But what we need to do now is actually take this, take another page and use the AND gate. So our first input to the AND gate, and we'll set the output first. So we don't forget, east white. The first input will of course be our lever, so that's west white. But what will the input be? It will be the variable zero. Now, if we flip this switch, it blinks. And if we flip it off, it doesn't. Let me just run that by you in case you didn't catch it. What we're doing here is we're taking the output of a timer, putting it into this variable, and then using an AND gate and the output of the switch to control the actual light. It's pretty cool, it's really powerful, it's sort of amazing actually. And these can get really complicated. We could put up the four switches here. We could put up the other things too. And if you think about it, if you have an AND gate, you know, with say four inputs, and say all of them have to be on for the AND gate to, to light up the light. Well, then you could actually use pages and have uh, and chain AND gates. So you could have any number of inputs up to the maximum size this system could possibly handle. So you can actually do a lot of stuff. You can actually have every single line from every single face coming in. So given that, um, let me show you just really quick two more functions that I think will be, use, uh, they'll be use, useful for our next build. I just want to introduce you to them so that you're not totally confused. The first function that I want to show you is a, a useful function. I use it all the time when I'm hacking around with RedNet called One Shot Pulse. What this does is just what it says in the tin. It makes it very fast. I'm not sure I'll be able to see it in this. You can't, it, it happens, but it's super fast if you look, right? What One Shot Pulse does is turn any signal into a very fast pulse, right? Uh, it's, it's super useful for just turning a switch pulse or switching things. It's useful. Why don't we dump that into a variable? variable zero in this case. Now, sometimes what if we'd like to see it, by the way, let's get rid of this. Let's just set this back to no op. So we have the one shot pulse in variable zero. Sometimes you'd like to take one of those one shot pulses and make it longer because it's so short, we can barely see it only if the computer is a little slow. Well, there's a really useful function called pulse lengthener, which if we give it a length, let's say half a second, and we give it an input, in this case, the variable zero, and then of course we set the output appropriately. This will take our one shot pulse and make it longer, half a second longer. But you'll notice that if we flip the switch, it comes on and then it immediately comes off. And we have to turn it off and turn it back on again to get the pulse. We're gonna be using these two functions in the next build, which I'm gonna show you right now. So I've taken the liberty of building an example factory. This is an early game factory. You've gotten some resources, you have a few diamonds, but you don't have much. This is a thermal expansion pulverizer, which if you haven't seen before, it takes ores and it doubles them. 
it turns one of these ores into two dusts, it's automatically and awesomely, I think, configured to output to the furnace, which then cooks things up, and it uses buildcraft energy. So typically, you'll see them hooked up with some engines. In this case, we've got some fuel here. Let's burn these. There we go. Got some nice buildcraft energy coming along, and that will refill the, the machines. And so you see people use these switches, these redstone switches, to control their engines. That's pretty normal. But are, should we be satisfied with that? I submit that we should not. After all, we have RedNet, and RedNet isn't that expensive. One controller can do, you know, many things, so why not go for a full build and actually use it early on? What we're going to do here is wire up this system using uh, only RedNet and vanilla mechanics to actually turn on these engines automatically and hold them on for a while. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? I hope so, because I just showed you how to do it. So first what we've got to do is we've got to figure out how to understand when there's work in the system. We've got a vanilla hopper here and a chest. And so whenever anything goes in the chest, it automatically gets sucked down through the hopper into the pulverizer. That takes, you know, mm, about four seconds. And then the two things get cooked up and that takes about, mm, you know, four seconds, five seconds. It could take a little bit longer if there's no power in the system. It could take a little bit shorter. It depends. So let's just say that it takes about 10 seconds per object. Well, what we need to do is watch whenever there's something through here, turn that into a, a, with a comparator. Let me show you how. Well, let's go over here. Let's break these. And uh, since everything gets sucked down into the hopper, we only need to do one of these. This is a redstone comparator. It's a vanilla object. And if you face its uh, large end, there, it will look at the contents of the inventory that the two prongs are facing, and if there's anything in there, it will output it. So for example, if I were to toss in a bunch of copper, and then a bunch of tin, the copper will get sucked away, and as you can see, the system lights up. So this is how we know that there's work in the system. Now we don't know for exactly how long each thing is going to go, so this system isn't perfect, and we're going to build in a safety margin. But we could get even more sophisticated, and we will in future episodes. But for now, let's just go ahead and make this work. It seems like it should be obvious, right? All we have to do is toss a piece of red net cable, let's say right here, and then we'll put one right there. Now the white line will be our input line, right? And let's, uh, hmm, 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 what we could do is let's just put our comparator or our system, our internet controller, right here. Okay, so now we've got white. Whenever white is on, we'd want to turn on our engine. So let's just dig out a little bit under here. Where are our engines? There they are. And we can always clean this up a little bit later, right? Right. So let's uh, have this here and just, whoop. I'll show you how to fix that in just a sec. That is what cable only mode is for. Because it's kind of, whoa, kind of ungainly, right? Okay, we got this. Let's just whip out our trusty Omni wrench. Oh, not up there. And let's uh, clean this up. Cable only mode. Cable only mode. Cable only mode. And come on, cable only mode. Pretty. There we go. Oh, and of course, cable only mode. Right. So now we have the white line on, let's say, uh, currently we're facing south. So the white line on it, this is east now. It's reversed from before. White line on east is output. Let's go ahead and just set this up really simply by tossing up a, um, hmm, how about if we put a lever? I have to be careful with the cables touch. We put a lever right, how about right in there? If we were to go like this, let's just abuse our op powers a little bit. And then let's put a lever right there. Okay, that will not be white. We'll call that, I don't know, red. red there we go so that's our that's our switch 
if we were to just set this up right now, I'm sure you could see that we could easily wire it up just by doing a pass through function from red. But what we'd like to say is when red is, hmm, let's say when red is on, it doesn't really matter, just pick one. And when this guy has work in it, then let's just turn on the engines for now for that. We'll just do the first page. We'll say an AND gate. When the top IOs red is on, is that the right? Yeah. It's like that's our red. And the top IOs, um, white is on, then we will output to the east IOs white signal. Okay, so that should be uh, that should be pretty easy, right? If, so we flip this guy. Hey, look at that. So that right there is a thing. That actually works, but it doesn't really capture the spirit of what we want to do, because obviously pretty soon, we're, as soon as we start supplying this guy with power again, you can see the reason the system's jammed up. What happened was the buffer ran out, and we want to run it for a while. Quite a while, actually. So, what we'd like to do is take a pulse from this and turn it into a much longer pulse. Well, I think we know how to do that. First, let's reinitialize the system. Okay, And then we'll say that um, a pulse widener Right? So what a pulse widener really does is, as soon as its input comes on, pulse lengthener, I'm sorry, same thing. When a pulse widener comes on, or when it gets a signal, it turns on, and then it doesn't turn off until um, after the timer's done. So let's set the length to a constant. Let's set the length to a really good number. Da -da -da -da. 200 clicks later, and there we are. This is now a 10 second, or 10 groups of 20, uh, ticks interval. So whenever anything passes through the hopper, it will, of course, require 10 more seconds. Great. Okay, cool. Right. So then what does that mean uh, for the next page? How do we then take the switch and the pulse lengthener and integrate? Them? Did I just say and? I did. You know it. Check it out. So if we just say from the up and from variable zero, and then we output to the east on white. Now, whenever anything has been in the hopper in the last 10 seconds, and the switch is on, let's see, anything in the hopper? Oh, no, we've actually burned through it. Let's toss that in. Look, the engines come on, and the system is now processing some tin. But this is not perfect, right? Because the problem we have is that actually, we don't want to keep running. So you can see here, let's just say we had a big stack of tin, and we pull out this copper. Well, then the light goes off, and uh, that means that we no longer have any actual signal, and our engines are going to stop after 10 seconds, long before it's done. That's no good at all. So what we'd like to do is actually make this even better. Let's do that really quick. Let's just get rid of that. Let's punch a hole right here. And this is the cool power of RedNet. So let's, um, we'll have to rearrange things. Give me just a sec. And that's all cleaned up. And it wasn't a very big change. I just moved our shutoff lever over, and I set up the system to output through the floor, through the downside. It was super easy. And as you can see, the cable just snakes down under there. Let's go back up front. So we need to replicate this setup right here, a chest or an inventory that a hopper pulls from and then empties out of. Now, I had to try a few times to build this because of a weird interaction between vanilla mechanics and thermal expansion. But what I have is pretty easy. You just need one extra hopper. So we just go like this, attach the hopper here. Well, actually, let's put down our uh, comparator first. It'd be easier. Comparator. And you can see the red neck cable's already listening. Put down the hopper here. And then we put down a hopper here. Now, the thermal expansion machine, as you can see, is configured to push out there. Uh, the orange side signifies that. So if we toss in a piece of copper, it will go through, it will process, and it will also, in the in the process, ah, you see it, the right, red light there, it triggered, and our engines come on. Now we have two signals letting the system know, hey, hold the engines on. We have one on the input and one on the output. And so all we have to do is toss a bunch of stuff in here, and it'll just keep working. And it'll hold the engines on for the entirety of it, and we never even have to think about it. But of course, if we want to cut it off to conserve fuel, perhaps, we can. No problem. And with that, I think that's a pretty good example of a real-world build. 
it's useful. Um, let's just talk about a couple final things involving uh, Redneck controllers. The last thing that any aspiring Redstone programmer will want to know about is the fact that, uh, well, you know, you start doing a build like this and you realize that actually the number of cir circuits you get, this number of pages, and the number of variables you get, which if I recall correctly is only 15, yes, or 16, is kind of low, may not even be enough. And while you could use multiples of these, you can't mean you, you still can't share variables between boxes, which is something you obviously would really like to be able to do. But have no fear. If you check in NEI or PRC, you'll see that there's actually upgrade cards. These uh, upgrade cards are not too expensive to start, just some gold, redstone, and plastic. But they are used in kind of a tiered recipe, so you use one to upgrade the next. And they go all the way up to a fairly expensive one. As you can see from the tooltip, they claim to add circuits and variables. Let's go ahead and take one of these, and if you just right-click one in there, you can see it even shows up a little model in there, like it's a little tiny uh, desktop computer and you're slotting in a graphics card. How cool is that? Let's just toss that in. Max upgrades. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look. And we get uh, 36. And uh, wow, we get we get so many variables. Look at this, so many variables. It keeps going and going. Let's just go over here. Uh, in total, you can end up with 159 variables. It's a lot of variables. It's a lot of variables. Not sure how you would possibly use them all, but I would love to see. And uh, you can also, this is really cool, let's say you built one of these factories and you're like, oh, I don't, I was a pain to set up, I don't want to go through all the trouble of troubleshooting it again. Well, if you make yourself a PRC memory card, which we will give ourselves one of, and as you can see, it's modestly expensive, not too expensive at all. We will give ourselves one of these. And then we run over here to our factory controller, and all we got to do is right click. It begins to glow. And then if we take it over here, and we right click, it downloads it. So now we can look in here and we can see that in fact our program has been copied over. So there's no more need to worry about uh, getting exactly the, the program written down because I don't even know how you would go about writing that down. It'd be a pain, right? It'd be a logic diagram. But now you can just copy it back over and it is not a one-use copy. You can push it over and over and then if you want to clear it, all you have to do is just craft it in a crafting recipe and it will just work. And so you can actually upgrade these guys as you need them. You can pull the upgrades out. You can save the program so you can move the box. Really, red, the programmable RedNet controller is an amazing device, and it lets you pretty much build whatever you want. It's arbitrarily complex Redstone systems. All right, folks, and with that, I would say that we are probably uh, going to let this episode end. It's been... Uh, a pretty long episode, longer than I'd really hoped, but there's just so much to cover, and I didn't even go over all the circuits. But don't worry, pretty soon we're gonna, I'm going to release another episode, and we'll just go over lots of practical builds. Um, I just didn't get time to it. It's already this episode's run really long, and you, you just you'll need a break in time to process. I highly encourage you to play with this and everything else in Mine Factory Reloaded. It's an amazing mod, and uh, you'll, I'm sure you'll find that you can immediately start doing things that before were just incredibly prohibitively complicated in Redstone. So give it a shot, and uh, stay tuned. And if you like this, uh, go ahead and subscribe. If you like this and haven't uh, downloaded Mine Factory Reloaded yet, go download Mine Factory Reloaded. Put it in your mod pack. Put it in your mod pack. There's no, there's no excuse. Put it Put it in your iPad. If they don't have it, demand it, because it's an amazing mod and you should have it, if only just for RedNet. And with that, thanks for joining me, and I hope you found this helpful. Uh, if you leave a comment with any questions, I'll try and answer them. If you have any corrections for me, I'll try and put those in as well. And thanks for watching.